Frank Myers. Uh, Frank is the president of Luxor Global Associates, an international business development and representation firm he founded in 2003. And the serv uh, global, Luxor Global Associates services include bilateral representation, connections to local infrastructure, search for key clients, Uh, search for key clients or trading partners, business strategy, development, and assistance and export requirements, ITAR compliance, and counter trade solutions. Frank is also the executive director of one of the driving forces between the recently formed Dutch American Business Accelerator, a local alliance of business people with ties to the Netherlands dedicated to leverage their knowledge and connections to help promote commerce between two countries. Different from most other help organizations, its members also have the ability to offer their services commercially in their area of specialization. And I will, I will, uh, you're in? Okay. So let me introduce Frank Mayer. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you for being here. Um, I, uh, it's my pleasure and uh, an honor to talk about uh, one of my favorite topics, which is called the Netherlands. Uh, just uh, to see a show of hands, does anybody at this point have any positive thoughts about the Netherlands? <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, it's, um, it's hard to cover uh, more than 400 years of history, so I need to sort of skip through a lot of things. But um, this is basically the shape that you will recognize, I hope. And uh, just uh, zoom up uh, to about 100,000 feet. Uh, we get something like this that puts it in better perspective. Um, you see that uh, it's a little country on the North Sea has a lot of uh, openings there where you have natural harbors uh, where ships can come in without going through docks and all kinds of other difficult stuff. Uh, it's centrally located between three giant economic powers, the UK on the left hand side on the east, uh, the, the Germany on the west, on the, on the east, sorry, and France on the south. Um, and because of its natural harbors and its connection, uh, not only does it have harbors, but it also has rivers going into the mainland uh, that are critically important. So that established basically Holland as a transit point for uh, ocean freight and freight from other countries into all of Europe, not just locally into the Netherlands. Um, there are some, some, some interesting fun facts that I thought I would mention. Uh, just to give you a perspective, it's about one-seventh the size of Arizona. So that's about uh, Maricopa and Yavapai County together. Uh, it has two and a half times as many uh, people living there. So if you would uh, multiply that out on the same scale as what we have, then you have the same, uh, if you had the same population density as in the Netherlands, you would have 115 million people living in Arizona. Just to give you an idea of to, uh, what, it, what it was like. Uh, one of the other amazing thing is that uh, the, the land mass that it takes up is uh, eight one thousandths of one percent of the world land mass, and yet somehow or the other it managed to be the third largest exporter of uh, agriculture products in the world. Um, a third of the country is below sea level, uh, and the Dutch are the uh, tallest people in the in the world. And there is that, there is a relationship between that two. Number one. Um, uh, the country is so densely populated that the only way you can grow is vertical. <laughs> in fact, rumor has it that in the future that you will only be able to applaud in Holland going this way instead of that way. Uh, of course, the other two reasons are the fact that um, they have been for ages uh, trying to keep their head above water and, and tiptoeing through the tulips. So all of that makes you uh, get taller. 
Uh, another interesting thing, KLM was the first airline in the world, and uh, to get to more recent times, uh, it ranks first worldwide in Twitter and LinkedIn, which is kind of an interesting fact, I thought. Um, the Netherlands, because of their location and uh, their background, have been sort of the pioneers in international business. And uh, I think there is a lot that we can learn from the thinking over there, and I hope to get to that later. Um, as far as history is concerned, in, in the 1500s they were under Spanish rule. There was an 80-year war with Spain, and so the Netherlands were overruled or were living under Spanish rule. And it's interesting to look at that in perspective to what happened to the United States, because in 1579, which is about uh, 200 years before 1776, uh, they decided to have, uh, they had had it with uh, living under Spanish rule, so they seceded from Spain and created uh, a republic of independent states, which was an unheard of concept in those days. Uh, the new Bill of Rights was based upon freedom of religion and self-government. And um, it's interesting to see what happened uh, when the uh, pilgrims uh, were looking for freedom of religion. They went to Holland and used it as a basis to prosper and then come to the United States in 1620 and 21. Uh, and brought with them uh, the, de the declaration copy, the copy of the Declaration of Independence from Holland uh, and uh, the uh, the Dutch um, um, Bill of Rights and uh, uh. anyways, they started at that time to put up uh, trading posts around the world. So that goes back to 15. 90, they formed an organ, a company called the VOC, the United, uh, in, in Dutch is the Verenigde the Oost Indies Company. Uh, in English, it's the United East Indian Company that you've heard of before. This is a coin that my grandfather dug up in his front yard in Holland from uh, VOC. It's dated from 1790. Uh, and 1790 sounds like it's an awful long ways back, but don't forget that 200 years before this coin was minted, they were already traveling around the world and setting up trading posts. So, in, uh, they started in, in, the, in North America in 1609 when uh, Mr. Hudson sailed up the river there and did something completely unusual for those days, which was setting up trading posts. And uh, that is uh, important. Uh, and then uh, Mr. Hugo Groot, or Hugo Grotius, as they did call him in those days, they all had a Latin version of, it, of their last name. They, he basically defined the foundation for international law. So this whole concept of doing international business uh, basically started very much in the Netherlands, a long time before we did. So if you're looking at this, uh, this, car, this uh, uh, map in perspective again, and you're looking where it's located in, in terms of the rest of the Europe, you see that within, within 300 miles, you have the industrial areas of uh, Great Britain, uh, the Holland, Belgium, Germany, uh, and the north of France. If you extend that to uh, 800 miles, the outer circle, uh, it basically covers the whole industrial world of, uh, of Central Europe. It also shows you uh, that uh, setting up a business uh, in Ireland or in England, if you are in the United States and you want to do business in the, U in the EU, uh, it's really not such a good idea because you're sitting on another island and now you need to go do another form of transportation from there. When you're in Holland, you're on the mainland and you can go from there all the way to where you want to go. Uh, you can also see that Spain is outside of that circle and so there are some plans I think here in Arizona to set up an office in Spain. Uh, to me that is not really the best move, but that's me. Um, here is... Uh, another map of the different countries. And it's important to know that you can go from the Netherlands from the rivers uh, via uh, waterways and rivers all the way to the Black Sea over here. You can go to the south of France, you can go to uh, anywhere in Germany. And uh, I mean, it sounds archaic uh, to talk about uh, moving things with barges uh, these days. Interestingly enough, they're going back to using barges a lot more for the simple reason that it's less expensive than using trucks 
it is much uh, greener, much less pollution than using trucks, and much more uh, less costly. So that that has a whole new uh, life, really. Oh, here comes the circle. Anyways, uh, what we call that is uh, the Netherlands is known uh, uh, as the gateway to Europe um, because you can go from the Netherlands into the rest of Europe by air, by rail, by road, uh, by water, and via an enormous uh, pipeline uh, uh, infrastructure. Um, the, th the three ports actually that, that form the Netherlands uh, as far as that uh, transit point is concerned is the port of Rotterdam, the port of Amsterdam, and Schiphol Airport. And the three of them together uh, are pretty much an unbeatable uh, combination. If you're looking at, uh, I think this is a million metric tons, I believe. Uh, so you can see that the harbor of Rotterdam uh, can handle more than the next three harbors in Europe. Uh, Antwerp, the Russian harbor that I can pronounce, and, uh, and Antwerp, Antwerp and, and Hamburg. Um, if you add uh, Amsterdam to that, you're getting close to 500 million metric tons. And if you compare that to the harbors in uh, the US, uh, it's kind of revealing that uh, Rotterdam alone uh, does about as much as Los Angeles, uh, Houston, and Louisiana together. So um, combine that then with Schiphol Airport, which is known uh, to be one of the best airports and run airports in the world. Uh, you see why it is uh, such a strategically great point. Um, there are other advantages I will get to uh, later. As far as the relationship between the U.S. and the Netherlands, it's the longest trading partner that the U.S. has had. It was the first country to recognize the sovereignty of the United States in uh, 1776. Uh, had the first U.S. Embassy in The Hague. Um, Interesting numbers here. The uh, Netherlands is the third largest investor in the United States of all the countries in the world at uh, $237 billion. Uh, conversely, the Netherlands is also the recipient of the largest uh, US uh, foreign direct investment. Uh, and the United States invests $471 billion in the Netherlands. And that makes it also the largest investor in the Netherlands. And we're also in awe about, uh, about China, but to put things in perspective, the United States total investment in China is about $25 billion. So that, I think, is, uh, speaks for itself. What comes from all these investments and the trade is that there is uh, U.S. exports to the Netherlands as a result of those investments that the Netherlands makes in the United States, $44 billion a year. And uh, the U.S. imports from the Netherlands is $24 billion. So the Netherlands is one of the few countries where the United States has a positive trade balance. Um, the number of jobs that are created because of those investments in the United States, uh, 370,000 jobs uh, in, uh, because of the, of, the, of the investments, and then another uh, 330,000 jobs created by U.S. exports to the United States. It is important to understand that. We, we typically here in the United States look only in one direction. We are focused on export and export only. Or we're looking for getting foreign investment in here without looking at the thing. What they do in Holland is they look in both directions at the same time. The 704,000 jobs created by the U.S. and your country, uh, Netherlands, is that the largest um, number of relationships with Europe? Um, I don't know that. Total number of US jobs. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I would imagine. See, the, the important thing to see is that um, from those investments, you get trade and, and commerce in both directions. And that's something that we, we don't seem to always understand here that, um, for example, um, if you want to find somebody in Europe that is interested in, in selling your products. What's a good way to do that? You can go to the Department of Commerce and they give you a list. Or you can do it in a different way. One of the ways that you can do that is you can buy stuff 
from that company if it has some product that you can sell yourself. Now this interested party that you want to do business with becomes your client. And they give you a line of credit and you start doing business with them and you build a relationship and they now learn to trust you. So if you want to now go in reverse, these people know who you are. They are much more inclined to give you a line of credit than they were when they had no clue who you were. And so that gets the pump primed. Now, what do we do with all this good money that we get? Uh, this was an interesting analysis, I thought. I've looked at uh, the three largest states uh, as far as uh, Netherlands foreign investment is concerned. So that's Texas is the number one, California and Massachusetts. Um, you can see that the second line is that uh, what the percentages of uh, what, they, what they get from the total U uh, Netherlands investment in the US. So that's uh, like 4% for Texas. Two and a half percent to California and one and a quarter percent for Maine. Arizona gets only uh, uh, a half of a percent. But interestingly enough, if you're looking at that in, in terms of the overall uh, gross national product for the states, it's about the same percentage. So although Texas gets a lot more, nine thousand. Uh, nine billion, nine point four billion dollars, and Arizona gets only one point two billion dollars. Uh, if you compare it as ranking is concerned, uh, in 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 Texas, it's uh, it's the fourth largest investment in the state. In California, the fifth, and in Arizona, it's also the fifth largest investment in the state. So in that respect, it is sort of on even par, although the number is much smaller than the other states. But what what happens with that money? Uh, what, what happens with these investments is, is an interesting analysis. The jobs that, we, that, that are created because of those investments in the first three states uh, are an order of magnitude larger than what we do in, in Arizona. It's 10%, 10%, 70%. In Arizona, it's only 5%. So it's, it's, it's half of what the other states do. Uh, and what becomes uh, even more disturbing is that uh, as a result of that investment in the state, um, typically we create business, we create jobs, we create export back to the country where it came from. And you can see that Texas, uh, that's 65% uh, of the amount that is invested goes back as export. In Arizona, it's only 19%. And if we see what we import from the Netherlands, it's, it's $4 million per year, which is three-tenths of a percent. So, are we looking at, are we really invest uh, or utilizing those investments uh, the proper way? I don't think so. There is an enormous opportunity, I think, for Arizona to uh, get in closer touch with the Netherlands and take advantage of that relationship that, was, that exists between the countries and the positive uh, inf information, uh, the positive attitude that the Netherlands has towards American states. And we can do a heck of a lot better with that money that we get, uh, and probably get more uh, if we did uh, a better job managing it and doing something with it. There are plenty of opportunities uh, in the Netherlands. Um, they, are, they are advanced, I mean, there are inventions like Bluetooth was invented in the Netherlands, uh, the CD was invented in the Netherlands, and uh, I have here to show you the, uh, the, the hole in the CD is the diameter of the old Dutch dime fits perfectly in there. Um, we have uh, Tom Tom is from the Netherlands and uh, there's a whole list more. Um, so uh, renewable energy, uh, micro bio microbial and algae uh, based biotechnology, aerospace, uh, advanced military products, waste management, water management, uh, agriculture, uh, I mean it's incredible all the stuff. There is something that I have called in, in, uh, in quotation marks uh, entomoltines, uh, which are uh, proteins derived from bugs. That's, uh, that's the latest new development that's going on. Why? Uh, because uh, we are quickly running out of food if we keep on growing the population on this earth the way we are. And so what they're doing is uh, some serious investigation as to uh, what other proteins we can create. It turns out that if you feed, uh, I think, 20, 22, uh, 20, 22 pounds, no, 27 pounds of uh, feet 
uh, food to a cow, you get about two, per, two pounds of protein back. So it's not terribly, the cows are not terribly efficient and they are a mess. Uh, one of the big problems is what to do with all the manure, by the way. Uh, when you feed that same amount of, uh, of food to bugs, uh, you get about uh, 27 pounds of food for, for bugs, you get about 22 pounds of protein back. That's nice, clean protein. You don't have to think about it as uh, I'm going to have to eat uh, fried spiders and cockroaches. Uh, it is just clean, uh, powdered protein. Uh, and by the way, uh, if we have uh, uh, problems like uh, health problems or so, uh, many times when we deal with uh, animals, um, those infections are passed on to us as humans. Uh, the stuff that we get from bugs are completely bacteria free. So you need to think about it as, uh, uh, as uh, soy powder or something like that and it becomes part of the thing so we can have a bug burger in the future. <laughs> um, logistics and distribution are just another opportunity uh, where we have uh, plenty of ways of doing things. When you think about international air travel, for example, uh, it's just an opportunity waiting to happen in my opinion uh, as air, uh, air traffic controller. Uh, uh, the last thing you want to do when somebody has been flying for 10 hours is uh, divert them to somewhere else. And uh, with all the airports that we have along the coast, that's a distinct possibility. In Arizona we have uh, four days of bad weather and the other 361 are, are good weather. So it's a natural place to uh, have uh, connections to Europe. Why don't we have connections with Europe? Because the airlines make money with freight. Where does freight get uh, transported in airplanes? In white bodies. How many airplanes with white bodies land in Phoenix per day? One. So, no wonder that we don't get anything. But if we could change that and we had more stuff to export or to transport from Phoenix to Europe, and we would have more white bodies, then I think we would be a natural uh, for expanding that enormously. <clears throat> Anyways, there are all kinds of good reasons why Holland, and, and, and again, most people think that, that the EU is all the same. It isn't. Every country in the EU is different. The, the, the taxes are different, the cost of living are different. Um, we are very comfortable, as I said before, to go to England to set up an office because they speak English. How wonderful is that? Well, guess what? In most countries they speak English as well, and certainly in Holland, uh, given that they live within, between those uh, three other uh, uh, economic entities, uh, most everybody that has uh, anything more than elementary school in Holland speaks uh, four languages. Um, so, uh, interestingly enough, uh, one of the advantages of the Netherlands as a place to be is that people do speak those languages. In England, people speak English, but they don't speak any other language most of the time. So it's a problem if you want to get into Europe. Um, there 